I won't keep you but just a minute. But I do think you, you need to hear this this morning. Micah, um, Malachi 4, six says this. It says, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. I believe the stories that you've heard from the heart today from Brian and Travis and Lisa and Byron about their, their dads that these guys that they talked about, Mr. Randall, Lynn's dad, they were heroes to these guys. They looked at them. Like Byron said, some of you didn't have the relationship with your dad that, that Byron and I had or that one of these folks had. But those that had a dad at home that took care of you and you, loved you, they were heroes. There was a teacher that asked a little boy one time to that ask, ask their class to write essays about their daddies. And so the little boy brought his essay home and showed it to his mom and daddy. And the father looked at it. And when he looked at it and began to read it, it was an essay about his hero. And so the daddy read it. And when he read it, he just started to cry looking at this essay that the little boy had written that he had chosen him to be his hero. So daddy looked, uh, daddy looked at the little boy and said, Son, said, why did you pick me? He said, Daddy, I couldn't spell Schwarzenegger. <laughs> but up, up. Dad joke, huh, Em? I believe every dad needs to be a hero to their kids. And God makes it plain at the beginning of Scripture that he holds the dad responsible for the decision of the family and the destiny of the family. Just like a quarterback for the team has a good game or a bad game, it kind of falls on his shoulders because he's quarterback. An airline captain is in charge of the passengers and the people that are on the ride with him in the air. And if we look back at history and we looked at who sinned first, we know it was Eve that in the garden that was deceived and then talked Adam into what he did. But God held Adam accountable because he was the man. And he was accountable for the choice that he made. And this morning I feel we as men, as fathers, need to feel somehow responsible for the issues in our society. And a lot of the problems that we're facing in our society have to be laid at the feet of fathers that have fled their place of responsibility to be the spiritual leader in their home. Can you say amen this morning? They've neglected their responsibility of being the spiritual head of their home. I just married Seth and Becca a few weeks ago. And in their vows, I told them, you are responsible as the head of this home. God has chosen the man to be the spiritual head of the home. Now, that doesn't mean your wife is under your feet. That's not what it means. Remember the vows? It doesn't mean that you dominate her. It doesn't mean that the ring that she wears is a shackle, but it's a reminder of God's love to you and your love one to another. There was a little boy that his daddy was on a business trip, and the little boy told the mom, said, hey, mom, I want to be in charge tonight. So he said, Okay. You sit where your daddy usually sits. So the boy's sister looked at him and said, I think you're too young to be in charge. So she decided to challenge him about his authority. She said, okay, if you're the man of the house and you're in charge, little man, what is two plus two? He said, I ain't sure. Ask your mother. Took his spot real quick, didn't he, Jay? <laughs> I want to say this this morning. If we don't have godly fathers living godly lives and building godly homes and raising godly children, it doesn't matter who this nation chooses as president or who controls the Congress because the United States will not thrive and it will barely survive without some faithful fathers. Yeah. Without some faithful fathers. Now, I know this morning many of you have already raised your children, and many of you are either waiting for or already have grandchildren, and some of you may even be raising your grandchildren at this point. 
Dwight Moody said this, if you want to know kind of what kind of parent that you were, don't look at your children, look at your grandchildren. And see what kind of legacy that you've taught your sons and daughters to give to their children. I want to give you three quick things. If you want to be a faithful father, the first thing you need to do is invite your children to receive the Lord. Invite your kids to receive the Lord. The number one responsibility as a dad or a granddad is to see to it that your children and your grandchildren, Wayne, establish a relationship with Jesus just like your daddy wanted you to do. What good, listen to this, what good does it do your children to be raised in the finest home and have the finest education, get the finest job, to marry the finest girl or the finest boy, to help him get a career and to help him reach the finest position in life and bury him in the finest casket and lay him in the finest grave and then watch him stand in eternity in judgment to meet a God that he don't even know. Invite your children to know who Jesus is. It's the most important thing you could ever do as a father. Another thing, teach your kids to revere the Lord. Deuteronomy 6.5, you almost jumped on my stuff there, Brian. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. Fervently, with all your heart. Nothing will break the heart of God more than a half-hearted love. We have too many Christians that love God just enough, come a half a day on Sunday, just come half the time, just to give God half the tithe, half of nothing. Husbands that are here this morning, a half-hearted love sure ain't going to make your wife happy. And parents, a half-hearted love to your kids aren't going to make your children happy. And Christians in the room today, a half-hearted love to God won't make him happy either. We love him fervently. We love him faithfully with all of your heart and all of your soul. Your soul, your mind, it's the will, the emotions. We love God with our innermost being to the very depths of our minds and the very center of our feelings. Firmly, we love him firmly with all of our strength. Love the Lord your God, men, with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Teach your children to do the same thing. We got to show them what to do. We do baby dedications, and I use these words. Instruct your children to be a reflection of the Lord. Deuteronomy 6, 6, and 7 says, And these words I've commanded to you today that they shall be in your heart, that you teach them diligently to your children. You talk about them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. Folks, let me tell you something this morning. God intended your home to be the university of life. And dads to be the professors. And children to be the students. And the curriculum you need is this. The curriculum you need in your home is this right here. Because, see, your home is where the next generation decides how it's going to live. The home is where the next generation decides. Decides how to live. Let me say that one more time. The home is where the next generation learns how to live and decides how they're going to live. I love what Aaron Wilburn says about his mama and what he learned at home. He said, I think I need to take my mama and load her up in my car and take her into some neighborhoods and let her do some drive-by whoopings. Teach your kids diligently. Teach them daily. And to teach them di- diligently and to teach them daily, it has to be deliberately. Did you get that? If you're going to teach them diligently and you're going to teach them daily, it's got to be deliberately. Because here's the thing, men. If the devil don't get you and your kids with sin... He'll sure as heck get you with busy. Let me say that again. If the devil don't come at you and tear you down with sin, he's going to sneak in the back door with busy. Diligently, daily, and deliberately teach your kids. 
Deuteronomy 6, 8, 9 says, you're, you're to bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be on the frontlets between your eyes. I was like, what the heck is a frontlet? So I looked. It's like a headband. It's like something that you would have wrapped around your head and pulled tight. Have it firmly written on your hands and a frontlet between your eyes. Write it on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. What's he saying? Try more than one way. Do everything that you can, not only to read them the word and teach them the word, but put it in front of them. Put it in front of them on your hands in the way that you touch them and on your heart in the way that you speak to them and on your mind as the way that you deal with them. Put the word as a frontlet that never leaves. And when they look at you, they'll see it on your head and they'll see it written in your hands. The word of God and the God of the word needs to saturate our living rooms and our dining rooms and our bedrooms and our laundry rooms and our playrooms. Can you say amen? It starts with us each individually. When we don't teach the children and burn the word within them, look what happens. Look what happens. And this is us. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him, and you shall take oaths in his name. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are all around you. For the Lord your God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord your God be aroused against you and destroy you from the face of the earth. When a nation forsakes God, they begin to ask the question, and you've heard this on the news, who needs a God? Who needs God? Don't bring God into this. Let me tell you what, Jesus is the only way that we get through this. The love of God is the only way that we get through this. That's what happened to the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel, when you study their history and you find out that after they entered into the promised land, they went through four stages. Look at this. They went through independence. Then they went through indulgence, then they went through indifference, and then they went through irreverence. If you watched Fox News this morning on Channel 44 on cable, you heard about independence, indulgence, indifference, and irreverence. And it starts at the house, boys. It starts at the house. If it gives you a queasy feeling to think about that in our nation... It should because nothing is sacred anymore. Nothing is. If you think about it, and here, this is my daddy. Daddy said this. In our schools, we hand out condoms, but we doubt law Bibles. We, def we defend profanity as free speech, but we deny prayer as religious intrusion. We promote propaganda of evolution without God and highly, actively hide the evidence of creation by the true God. We've gone after materialism and intellectualism and humanism and secularism. And what happens? The building block of society, the family, fractures and is falling and is failing. There's one thing to change it. There's one thing, men, and that's fortifying the fathers to be faithful. That's a mouthful. Fortifying the fathers to be faithful. Because when the fathers are faithful, then they can fortify their families. Can you say amen? amen? We just need a few good men. Men full of compassion who laugh and love and cry. Men who'll face eternity and aren't afraid to die. Men who'll fight for freedom and honor once again. We need a few good men. There's only one that can fortify the family. And bring the family back to God. The president can't do it. The governor can't do it. The sheriff can't do it. And the preacher can't do it. It's you, men. It's faithful fathers who serve a faithful God. I want to leave you with one more statement. God, it's my prayer this morning that you let me be a father that prays like Nehemiah, obeys like Daniel, leads like Moses, builds like Noah, fights like David, educates like Paul, 
protects like Peter, and loves like Jesus. Lord, let me be that man. All the men in the house, would you stand up this morning, whether you're a father or not? All the men in the house, stand up this morning. Men, would you confess that with me this morning? Say it with me. God, let me be a father that prays like Nehemiah, obeys like Daniel, leads like Moses, builds like Noah, fights like David, educates like Paul, protects like Peter, and loves like Jesus. That's powerful, isn't it, Patrick? God, let me be that man. Let me be that man that prays like Nehemiah. You think, I don't even know who that is. Well, go home and look him up. It's the textbook. Obeys like Daniel. Leads like Moses. Builds like Noah. In the middle of nowhere. Fights like David. Educates like Paul who wrote the New Testament. Most of it. Protects like Peter. And then loves like Jesus. Father, this morning we come to you. We come to you in thanksgiving for our earthly fathers that you've given us. But today, Lord, we come to you and thank you that you are a faithful father. You're a good, good father. So this morning, Lord, as all the men in the house are standing... We just come, Lord, and we just ask you to allow us to be that man. Praise like Nehemiah. Obeys like Daniel. Leads like Moses. Builds like Noah. Fights like David. Educates like Paul. Protects like Peter. But more than anything, Lord, let us love like Jesus. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the blessings of this day. And we ask you, Lord, that we'll leave here not like we came in the name of Jesus. I ask you that we leave challenged and lift it up in Jesus' name. Everybody said together, amen. amen. I want to thank again Travis Jeffrey, Brian Clifton, Lisa Stanifer, my brother Byron. Would you give all of them one more big hand? Great job. LG, loving God. We'll see you tonight at 6 o'clock for prayer right here at the altar. Go love on your daddies. <laughs>